tragedy struck at the heart of France this week after fire nearly destroyed the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. Much was lost, but what was miraculously saved? Art historian Dr. Liz Lev and Father Pierre Henri discuss the cultural and religious significance of Notre Dame for France and the world. And EWTN host and author Father George Rutler talks about his latest book, Grace and Truth, 20 Steps to Embracing Virtue and Saving Civilization. And the president of the Franciscan Foundation for the Holy Land, Father Peter Vasco, is back with an update on the state of the Christian community there. Finally, author and Hollywood movie producer Devon Franklin returns to tell us all about his latest film, Breakthrough. The World Over Holy Week edition begins right now. From Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. An important show for you tonight. Liz Lev, Father Pierre Henri, Father Peter Vasco, and Devon Franklin are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Let's get right to the big story of the week. Fire tore through Notre Dame's Cathedral in Paris, France. And the country is focusing on reconstruction with President Emmanuel Macron setting a goal of rebuilding the Gothic landmark within five years. Donations are pouring in from all over the world. On Wednesday, President Trump announced via Twitter that he had spoken to Pope Francis, offering him his condolences and assistance to rebuild the cathedral. He also tweeted, I offered the help of our great experts on renovation and construction, as I did in my conversation yesterday with President Emmanuel Macron of France. I also wished both Pope Francis and President Macron, a very happy Easter. Nearly a billion dollars has already been raised to rebuild Notre Dame, with France's three richest families pledging $565 million. Here to talk about the cultural and spiritual significance of that ancient house of worship, I'm joined by art historian and author of How Catholic Art Saved the Faith, Dr. Liz Lev from Rome, and here in studio, Father Pierre Henri. He's the pastor of St. Louis of France, Catholic Church in Washington. Thank you both for being here. Father, what do you think as you saw those flames going up on this unbelievable cathedral, so beautiful and means so much to so many, give us a sense of the significance of Notre Dame to the people of France and, and, and the country that has become so secular and multicultural in many ways? Well, I would say uh, it's uh, so surprising at first I thought it was just a small fire where as you can mm -hmm. have some. And then as time was going, I was so impressed and say, oh gosh, when you know that is a full forest that was needed to build this full roof. Yeah. Uh, 53 acres worth yes. of for ancient, 800 year old timber yeah. up there. And it was built and French people consider that there. It's their cathedral, even though maybe they don't practice, even though they're in a Catholic culture, mm -hmm. uh, but it's really the, the a spiritual center, of course, for the Diocese of Paris, from which I am, mm -hmm. but even from a lot of French people around, Notre Dame de Paris, it's Notre Dame de Paris as a spiritual center, as a cultural mm -hmm. center, and that's from this cathedral that all the roads, uh, the kilometers are counted starting from Notre Dame. Ah. So it's a huge symbol for uh, French people. Mm -hmm. And so I would say it was so impressive because I was ordained over there. So I wow. just lie down in the cathedral. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you say, oh, gosh, it's burning. And yeah. it's burning on the Holy uh, Friday, too. Yeah. And I was looking as more the fire was going more and more, seeing how the French people would gather more and more around in Paris, mm -hmm. of course. But it was really an affair, yeah. really something strong. And... I was, by looking at all these images, I was thinking about the Gospel of Palm Sunday, mm. uh, where Jesus says he's been criticized by his, the, sorry, his disciples mm -hmm. are criticized uh, because they are just acclaiming him in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, if they don't acclaim, then the, the rocks 
will cry. Cry out, yes. yeah. And I would say, seeing that, I was impressed because it, it looked like it was what ha was happening. Mm -hmm. French people, maybe we are, uh, we are Catholic, a lot of them are Catholic, but with the French Revolution, mm -hmm. uh, I would say the French people had a hard time to get into a real profound, true way of Catholic life. Mm. And suddenly you had everybody that would raise up and say, hey, that's our cathedral. Yeah. Hey, we're at home. Hey, the house is burning. Yeah. And that what impressed me when Tuesday morning, everything, people say, okay, I want to give money to rebuild. We need to rebuild. That's yeah. what the, the president of French, France said uh, yeah. at night. Uh, Father and Liz, I, I had a friend uh, who's a secular Parisian who called me and said, I felt like my heart was being ripped out. Now, this is someone who doesn't go to church, doesn't practice the faith. He said, I felt like my heart was getting ripped out watching this. And he said, you don't realize or think about your heart until it's gone. Liz, from the perspective of an art historian, this cathedral, it took 200 years to complete, beginning in 1163. It survived wars and vandalization, the Huguenots, rebuilding, renovations. What have we lost here? Well, the, the church has actually survived so much that what we've really done, and I suppose in a certain sense, is we're getting ready to add another chapter to its history. Mm. Yes, we've lost the spire. Yes, we've lost the roof. Yes, some of the interior of the church is damaged, but the church will be rebuilt as it was rebuilt in 1861 by Violet Le Duc, as it had to be repaired already under Louis XIV. Mm -hmm. It's part of the, the beauty of this church, I think, is its endurance. And mm -hmm. how many times has there been this exodus of the French from the faith? If it's not the Huguenots, then it was the when it became the Temple of Reason and then the back and forth between yeah. the, the secular state and the, and the, and the Christian state. There's, it's fascinating to see how the, 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 the people of this cathedral, they make this exodus, but then they return, and they return in times of suffering. Mm, yeah, it becomes, a, it, it, it becomes a, a magnifying event, that, a clarifying event. Now, all week, commentators have, have mentioned the artistic value of Notre Dame, Liz, uh, but is it reductive to refer to it and consider it simply as a great artistic and architectural masterpiece? I, I've been listening to this all week, mm -hmm. and I realize that as, a, as, as Catholics, we get upset when people see it as just a building. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to look at it from the perspective of people who are trying to hold on to their, you know, they're embracing their secularism, mm -hmm. and yet they still love this building, and they have to put it into some kind of context. Mm -hmm. What is attracting this, people to this building? What makes this building so fascinating it's it's that it's beautiful and mm. that it's beautiful and it's 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 the result of people giving their lives in a certain very very specific type of humil humility think of the people who started work on that church 200 years to build right, right. you start work and you know you're not going to see it done mm. but you have a faith that the next generation is going to bring it on and yeah. the next generation is going to continue and that the next generations are going to keep that church going into the future yeah. so i think what what even though maybe they can't bring themselves to say that, that oh, it's a great church, they are responding to two things, mm -hmm. a universal love of beauty mm. and also that faith that built that church and rebuilt it and rebuilt it and rebuilt yeah. it again. So we don't have to make them say it. Yeah. Their pure love and expressions are really making it kind of clear. Yeah, well, and Liz, uh, as you pointed out over so many uh, years here and I know you took my friend Monsignor Nolte uh, through Notre Dame not long ago and we were just talking about it the other night and uh, he was commenting and it, it reflects exactly what you're saying he recently renovated his church and the man who came in to repair the stained glass and renovate them was the great grandson of the man who installed them so it's that same kind of uh, faith and craftsmanship that is passed on from generation to generation. Father, I want your reaction to this. Uh, Cardinal Raymond Burke had this to say, and he kind of put this devastating fire in a spiritual context. Here's what he said. Viewing the ravage of the Cathedral of Notre Dame by yesterday's fire, men and women of faith are led to consider the attacks upon the infinite beauty of the faith by the grievous sins and crimes of our day. Yesterday's event is a sobering reflection upon the destructiveness of man's rebellion against beauty, truth, and goodness. Father, your reaction? Well, I would say uh, 
why not is every time you, you touch it symbols which is mm -hmm. uh, Notre Dame is a reality but it's a symbol of faith a symbol of purity a symbol of a, a movement toward heaven mm -hmm. uh, it, you touch to something which is so deep in humankind mm -hmm. and that's what I would think why people react to say we've got to save it we have a right. as uh, Dr. Lady was speaking about Lev, yeah. Uh, yeah, was showing us is the church by itself is a living uh, corp. I would say, right? Yeah. So the, the, the stones are living. I mean, yeah. I, as I said on Fox the other day, when you were when you were watching this church and you see it coming down or the roof coming down, you're watching 800, almost a thousand years of yeah. French belief go up in flames. This yeah. is the belief of the French people lived out and exa and and uh, externalized in craftsmanship yeah. and beauty. And I was thinking about uh, Jesus to Saint Francis saying, "Rebuild my church." Mm -hmm. And for me, I think we are in a time where uh, as the Christians and maybe more as a Catholic Church too, uh, we really have to be engaged personally yeah. uh, as uh, Pope Francis is trying to have the church move out, move on and rebuild the church mm -hmm. and go to the, the power of faith, the beauty of faith and spreading out it. And I would think this fire for me it, and I think for a lot of people it touches this aspect is how are we going to rebuild the church? It's not only rocks, it's not just to yeah. show off. It's how are we really going to yeah. be living the Christ in this And Liz, world. I want to get into that in a moment with you. But I want both of you to consider this question. Father Jean-Marc Fournier is the chaplain of the Paris Fire Brigade. Uh, he is being called a hero today for saving not only the Blessed Sacrament, which is really why this house was built, uh, but the crown of thorns, which has been venerated for centuries. Uh, it is one of the treasures of Notre Dame. He went in with the firefighters into the cathedral. Father, how important are these relics? And then, Liz, I'm going to ask you the same question. How important are these relics to the French people, Father? The crown of thorns, the tunic of the, the, the St. Louis, Saint, Saint Louis of France, the, the parish you run here in D.C.? Well, I would say that's unique. And since it's been unique... Uh, it was the unique first, but it was the crown of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And always, uh, like relics, it relates us back to God and to Christ himself. Mm -hmm. And since we're human beings, we really need to, we need to touch things. And that's how uh, God just gave us the blessed sacrament. Mm -hmm. And for this priest, I got to, to hear his testimony as how he did it. Mm -hmm. And it was just amazing. He just said, when I pick up the Blessed Sacrament, I couldn't do nothing else uh, than blessing all this cathedral that was going on fire and say, mm -hmm. let God. And what surprised me as I was blessing it, the fire that, was start, that had started in the towers just started to stop. Wow. And so I would, as a uh, as Christian, I would react and say, yeah, I mean, Jesus is acting in our life if we just call him. Mm. But if we don't do it, I mean, what can he do in our lives? Yeah. So it's very impressive and maybe a, a yeah. beautiful testimony. No, of, it's chilling. Yeah. It's chilling. And, the, and, the, and Liz, when you saw the cross there and the whole altar and the, the beautiful Pieta, that that all survived, it, it made me think of the great uh, Joan of Arc line, you know, hold the cross higher so I can see it through the flames. Uh, and, and there was the cross. But reflect on the, the cross that we saw and the importance of these relics, historically speaking. Well, I, the, the, the crown of thorns, I, I've been to venerate the crown of thorns on, on several occasions because, I mean, you can. <laughs> and, uh, and it's amazing to me how many people I've run into. I just, you run into friends there. Oh, I didn't know you were in Paris. Where are we all? We're all here to venerate the crown of thorns. Mm. I look around and there are people from all over. And then there are people who come in and they walk up and they're curious. They're probably wow. not Catholic. They probably don't even know. They're just... Other people are doing it, but you can feel that magnetism. It's not mm. just something of the French people. Mm. That is something, even that, that circular unity of that, of that relic, it brings us all together. Mm -hmm. But for me, the testimony or the witness of that, of that chaplain of the firefighters, that witness, when the world saw someone who thought getting the Blessed Sacrament was more important than his own life, 
that's one of those moments that we need to hold up and show, yes, I believe this. I believe you run into the to a burning house to save the most precious thing. Mm. Well, the priest showed us the most precious thing in that church. It's a, it's an mm. amazing testimony for the whole world. I agree. I agree. Father, I, I can see you wanting to say something. Well, I would say uh, as of course, Blessed Sacrament is a major part of our life, and it's really Christ by himself being with us. And at the same time, as human being, as uh, walking with God in this world, uh, I would say uh, that we need uh, things that we can touch. And mm -hmm. especially the Holy Crown is getting, helping us getting more to the deep of what Jesus Christ is living this Holy Week. Mm -hmm. And as we are going to Holy Friday, as I was saying to my parishioners, and I think that's something we have to to accept in our lives is how are we are going to be able to go through uh, through Christ accepting this suffering. And it's, we're not looking for suffering, but we need to accept it, mm -hmm. and we can only accept it if we just yeah. look Christ. And I mean, this is a crown. We, we should just tell people this crown of thorns, Saint Helena. Uh, the 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 uh, history of this crown. Saint Helena goes to the Holy Land, retrieves it. Constantine gives it to the French king. I mean, this is this is um, you know uh, it, it it has a long, amazing history. And to have survived the revolution and and still be with us, it, it's an ama it, it is truly a treasure. I want to read something to you. Uh, Rolling Stone magazine uh, published a piece. And they quoted an art historian, Liz. I'll let you take first crack at this. This is a, from Rolling Stone. It is from the historian of architecture at Harvard, Patricio del Real. And he says this, the building was so overburdened, Notre Dame, with meaning that its burning feels like an act of liberation. And they go on to say that perhaps whatever is rebuilt should be rebuilt in the image of the French people today, meaning a secular multicultural uh, society. Your reaction to that? Well, I mean, hey, while we're at it, let's let's burn down St. Peter's and oh my gosh, that white supremacist Sistine Chapel. I mean, <laughs> seriously, this this person is supposed to teach architecture. He's supposed to teach people to mm. love and produce beauty, and he can't respect the people who made beauty in the past. Seriously, so they're so they're paying. Harvard tuitions to be taught this, mm. I, I, and, and of course, you know, the only place we would manage to publish something is something mm. like that is in Rolling Stone magazine. It's, mm. a, it's, it's just an indication of how uh, this element of the popular culture so secularized, it's like they're aliens watching the fire from another planet, mm. and they're unable to see the people kneeling around the church. They seem to be unable to notice all the people, whether they were Jews or Muslims or, or atheists, or they just didn't really think about religion, glued to the television set all feeling that same pain. I mean, where where is this person actually living? Mm. Actually, now, now that I think about it, isn't Notre Dame built on top of an old pagan temple? Yes. So maybe when they go to fix it up, they should seal that back up again, because it sounds like the pagans are popping out <laughs> through some hole in the floor. Father, do you want to react to that idea? Well, I would say, uh, you know, it's very easy to put people, as we say in France, to put people in boxes. And uh, sometimes we do it in everyday life because the life goes easier and faster. Mm -hmm. But French people, they are deeply Christians. And that's what maybe a lot of people don't get. Uh, and I would say uh, I've been arriving in the States for just five months and looking, we could say suddenly, oh, well, I'm, all American people are Christian. Mm -hmm. Well, no, sorry. Of course, maybe uh, some are baptized, a lot of go to their congregations. Mm -hmm. Okay. but. Do we really live as Christian? And maybe that's the point of this Holy Week, mm -hmm. is how do, uh, are we are able to live more and more with it? And this fire in Notre Dame, in a certain way, can help us to get this up into our lives. Mm -hmm. Say, okay, how am I each day rebuilding mm -hmm. Christ's life in me? The, the, there is a, there is a, a cultural tension in, in France today. I mean, uh, due to immigration, due to secularization, there is this cultural uh, tension. Now, the causes of the fire are still under investigation. And they, they have said they believe it's accidental, but the investigation goes on. I'm going to ask both of you, do you think they may have been too hasty, given, and Father, you know this better than I, 
given the string of church vandalisms in the last few years, particularly in the last year, you had almost a, a thousand since 2016, um, your, your thoughts, ha were authorities too hasty? It's true that there's a Christianophobia, you would say in English, mm -hmm. uh, and there are some, of course, but I would say uh, maybe it is more because Catholic people have a hard time in France, like most of the countries in Europe, just to speak loud and clear and, it does, and live peacefully with others. But regarding to, uh, Notre Dame de Paris, maybe it could, but I don't think so. It's from what it, it, it comes up, what the, fi the firemen would say, mm -hmm. it was maybe because they worked during the day and there was something, you know, you just... Flammable up in the attic. Yeah, and mm -hmm. as, I mean, that's bad, but the symbol of it, maybe we have, even though the, the, the court is going to get on and the, mm -hmm. the, the survey has looked what really started this fire, mm -hmm. but the symbol is powerful, I would say, and it, mm -hmm. it should help us to say, okay, are we moving back toward Christ mm -hmm. by Mary? And uh, I, we've got to get a thing. It's a church dedicated to Mary. Yes. In Catholic Church, in Catholic faith, uh, we just go to Christ by Mary. Yeah. You know, you know Liz, uh, I, when I was on Fox the other day, Martha McCollum and I were, were referring to the church as Our Lady. And I got a lot of notes saying, why do you keep calling this church Our Lady? Well, Notre Dame in French is Our Lady, as Father can attest. Um, give me a sense, though. Were they too quick? To, um, to say this is accidental as, as the cause of the fire? I think at the moment, presuming it's accidental makes perfect sense. My experience, my very limited experience is only our fire here, which took place in 1823. No, I wasn't there. <laughs> but in 1823, St. Paul's outside the walls went up, right. in, went up in flames in exactly the same circumstances. Ah. There were wood beams in the roof, caught mm -hmm. fire, and it took down. It, as a matter of fact, the damage looks remarkably similar to that right. of Notre Dame. The, the, the center caved in, but the facade and the apse were intact. So I, at the moment, I'm just, I'm just sticking with what I, the only example I know of a situation right. like this, which was a simple accidental fire caused mm -hmm. by something that happened doing work. Yeah. Liz, now money is already being promised. Uh, they've already got, it looks like, a billion dollars for the restoration. Now, there was a 3D scan of the entire structure done by a late professor at Vassar. What are we talking about in terms of time and effort to restore uh, 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 a church like this, a cathedral of this magnitude and vintage. People are talking about, their, I mean, the, the numbers are oscillating from, you know, a couple years, decades. I, I really think at the moment there's really, there's really not much that one can be sure about. Uh, the first, the finishing, you have to finish assessing the damage. So whether you're going to have to deal with big structural problems from the very bottom, re, 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 um, settling the entire building, if you're dealing with the roof. There's so much more that's left to know. It's a gigantic church. Uh, what does it hold? 10,000 people. It's 128 meters. I mean, it's, this is a lot of space they've got to cover. And we've just come out of, if you will, the triduum of this of this tragedy. Monday, we're sitting there, you know, at the foot of the fire, wondering if we're ever going to see the church again. Uh, Tuesday, we wait to hear what's been saved. And here we are Wednesday with the with you know, a great deal of the church is saved. It looks like it's going to be resurrected, but we can't really know how long or... <laughs> What it's, what, what it's all going to involve. Mm -hmm. uh, Father, I, I want to ask each of you this. Uh, what are we missing here? What has the coverage, and it's been pretty intense and amazing, frankly, internationally, the coverage of the, of the fire at Notre Dame. What has been missing through both the commentary and coverage to your eye? Father, I'll let you take first crack. I would say uh, it's hard for me to say because uh, I look a lot of uh, t French TV. Ah, you've been watching the French TV. Because, I mean, we had the, yeah. the, the first cameras over right. there and this. But I would say it's uh, one of the points would be the, the, signification, the signification of this fire. Mm -hmm. uh, but what it impresses me, and I think we will see it in the week, in weeks to go, uh, is how the French people reacted. Mm -hmm. And I would think that really what we're just starting to feel mm -hmm. is 
people just adopt, uh, of course, Notre Dame as a building, but more than that, a mm. spiritual center, and even more than that... As their mother. Uh, yes, but more uh, Our Lady of Notre Dame. Uh -huh. And uh, Virgin Mary is really, you know, it's, she is the, the first patron of France. Mm -hmm. And so every French people, I would think, have something in their soul as part, spiritual part, even though some, most of the time they are just way out from the mm -hmm. Catholic Church mm -hmm. or a Catholic faith, which be another thing. And maybe it can be a good, good sign, at least in France, but I would say maybe much larger than that, First, for French people to get together, mm. that one's part. And the second thing I noticed is the way all people all around the world just reacting, uh, Pope Francis reacted uh, today, uh, to the way Notre Dame is so special in Christianity. Yeah, yeah. So there, I yeah. think there's something here that is going to, need to be developed that maybe we're going to see. And uh, refocus the world's attention on this, this right. treasure that perhaps people took for granted even those living in Paris. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, I want to give you last crack at that, Liz. What have we missed this week in the commentary and coverage? I, I feel that um, I, I, one of the things that, one of the titles that France has is the eldest daughter of the church. And um, Notre Dame as the first really significant monument to be built in the city of Paris that would become the capital of France, that's sitting in the geographical center of the city, mm -hmm. that's sitting on top of this moment where the, the Temple of Jupiter, so that they put, they crushed out the pagan, the pagan origins and they mm -hmm. bring in this, this new church in the 12th century. I feel like as we keep discussing, you know, the loss of the beautiful church and, you know, is the spire and this and that, we've lost a sense of the struggle that wow. the eldest daughter of the church has had over her 1,700 years wow. or, or 1,500 years of mm -hmm. being the first nation to become Christian. Um, that struggle has been long. It's been very, very hard. And the struggle is not, if you think of how many times just in the 19th century, are we, are we secular, or are we Christian, are right. we secular, are we Christian? This, 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 is a, this, is an this is an amazing nation that has fought for faith for so long. We have no idea in the United States. Mm -hmm. we're, we're children compared to what we've been there. There are older adolescent sisters, and I feel like we should be looking to them and we should be really supporting them as they mm -hmm. once again rediscover this treasure that is the faith, their ancient, ancient faith. Yeah. Father, I'll let you uh, respond. Well. Um yeah, and I think the uh, point, too, which is very important, that Benedict XVI brought up more and more mm -hmm. as Pope John Paul II had already did, is the culture and faith, how the culture brings up faith. And I would say here we touch the way our people are touched by uh, the church and Notre Dame de Paris, which is when you look at it all around the scene, mm -hmm. around is so beautiful, and, and there's something... It brings us, it is the expression of Christian people. It is uh, even the, the expression of Catholic brains, sort of, mm. say. Yeah. And I think when you look up to Notre Dame, it brings you yeah. simply toward Christ. Well, I, I thank you both for your reflections, and, and I agree. Uh, Pope Benedict has written so movingly about uh, the Catholic roots of Europe um, urging uh, the European Union and all the countries of Europe to remember and to uh, revivify their, their Christian and Catholic roots. This is a big reminder, I think, in, in a, in a you know, not so gentle way, but a big reminder of those roots, what they mean. This church, its beauty didn't come from nothing. It came from faith. It came from belief and struggle, as Liz pointed out. Thank you both. I'm, I'm so glad we had you on the program. Uh, how Catholic art saved the faith, the triumph and beauty of truth in Counter-Reformation Art by Dr. Elizabeth Lev is available everywhere, and uh, we encourage you to get it. Father, thank you for being here. And, and you know, I want to leave you all with, uh, there, were, there were small groups of pilgrims uh, from Paris, young people, who took to the streets this week singing uh, hymns to Our Lady around the cathedral, and um, I, I want to leave you with a moment of that.
My next guest has been living in Jerusalem for over three decades, and he served as president of the Franciscan Foundation for the Holy Land for more than 25 years. I sat down with him recently to discuss the challenges of keeping Christians in the Holy Land, given the persecutions faced by many in the region. Here's my exclusive with Father Peter Vasco. Father, many don't realize there are 150 to 160,000 Christians in the Holy Land. Tell us what the Franciscan Foundation for the Holy Land does day in and day out to preserve and nurture that struggling population. And in full disclosure, I am a board member of the foundation. Well, basically, it's come down to one big factor, education. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're very proud to, to announce that we've given over uh, 569 college scholarships, free college scholarships to these young, these young Christians. Uh, and 98% of them secure jobs in their various professional fields. Mm -hmm. That has been the secret of stemming the Christian exodus. Mm. Uh, and when you see these young people who had no, uh, no, no uh, funding, but had great academic acumen, uh, we gave them a free college education, and now they're working, they're earning, they're getting married, they're able to afford a, a house, an apartment. Uh, the second part of the uh, educational success has been through the uh, vocational schools in mm -hmm. Jerusalem. And we have over 350 students who have gone through a two-year program to learn, for example, uh, electri uh, electricians, to be electricians, mm -hmm. uh, carpenters, plumbers, uh, metal workers, etc. Now, those uh, jobs that the minute they graduate, everybody they're needs, employed, yeah. they're employed. Yeah. So these two areas are extremely important in keeping our Christians there. And these are the ones who were going to leave, and now mm -hmm. these 800 and 900 people are now wow. staying. It's incredible. It's yeah. incredible. It's really... And it's, a, a lot of your work, your day job, when you're not running the foundation, uh, you are out, and we've seen you, when presidents visit, when uh, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary yeah, of Defense, last week, was recently yeah, in the Holy Land, yes. there you were taking him around. What, Secretary of State, rather. Give me your impression of how are people feeling about the safety of the Holy Land? I always hear, well, I'd like to go, but I'm worried about the Gaza rockets we saw a few weeks ago, and I don't think I can go. The problem is that the media, the secular media, uh, their bureau chief is in Jerusalem, and they're speaking about incidents that happened 200 miles away. Mm -hmm. And so they think, oh my gosh, look, this is, this is the, the militants are here in Jerusalem, and they're, and they're killing people, and they're, they're running over, uh, over people and, and hurting people. Not just the opposite. It's, it's very, very safe. There, I've been Gadi now, uh, Raymond, for the last uh, 31 years, okay? Mm -hmm. Never has there been a, 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 a pilgrim ever hurt or injured because of some so-called war mm -hmm. or battle. There is none. It's always taking place 200 miles away in Gaza, yeah. not in Jerusalem. Yes, you have these, these protests, etc., cetera, but, but nothing ever happens to the pilgrims. We're going to the holy sites of Christianity that are in basically West Jerusalem, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So the area, the location, location, location mm -hmm. is the key. Uh -huh. And people don't understand that since they don't, yeah. they've never been to the Holy Land. No. But it's very safe to go. It's extremely safe. Yeah. And if I, if I thought it was, it was dangerous, I would tell my groups, don't, don't bother coming. Right. But nobody has ever been uh, affected by that. There was some, there was some incident at the Temple Mount uh, just a few weeks a few ago, a week ago, ago. Yes. and uh, my son was in the Holy Land at the time, and his tour group called and said, oh, we're going to cancel everything in Jerusalem. I said, guys, go do something else today. Go tomorrow. You'll be fine. Exactly. And exactly. that's what happened. That's what happened, exactly. Yeah. And Galilee uh, is, is extremely safe. Uh, there's nothing going on there. There's never any, any, no any, any protests, but no. Jerusalem, from time to time, you have protests, but they, people are thinking, they're, oh, they're fighting in the streets. Oh, it's so dangerous. I'm not going to go there. Hogwash, no, excuse me. Frankly, d yes. Detroit and Chicago are probably more dangerous. I but would anyway, think so yes. Uh, tell me about the restoration of really what I consider the epicenter of the shrines in the Holy Land, uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which has both the burial site as well as the site of the crucifixion under one roof, which people don't often realize. Exactly. Well, as you know, the University of Athens uh, undertook a restoration of the tomb a year and a half ago. And they were to, to restore the etiquette 
uh, strengthened the tomb. in the tomb, strengthened the bolts of the of the tomb. They took off the the uh, the steel beam that the British put it in 1933. Mm -hmm. They 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 cleaned the the outside of it and the inside. They redid the tomb, etc. The last thing they did was they took an X-ray under the tomb. Mm -hmm. This is the day before they were leaving, mm -hmm. and they saw that it was all rubble. There was nothing to support the tomb. And so this was in, in, in the National Geographic magazine. Yeah. And so it was our turn, the Franciscans, to now take over that job and to redo the tomb underneath. So we're looking at the uh, co College of Sapienza University in Rome. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to cost between three to four million dollars. Uh, but once the agreement is signed by the three communities, Greek, uh, Greek Orthodox, Armenian, and us, uh, the study will begin. It'll take one year, so you're talking 1220. Right. And by 1221, when they begin the actual uh, restoration underneath the tomb to strengthen the tomb, mm -hmm. the tomb will not be open to the public. Wow. 2021. Because oh. they will so, have to. It's, so visit now. Is the visit really now is the, the best time. The next year and a half. Yes. Wow. And yeah. so when you say rubble, the, the, the foundation beneath beneath the, the tomb, what the remains of the tomb, it's it's rubble. It's rubble. And and the, as they said, the problem is is that with hundreds of thousands of people stepping into that tomb, mm -hmm. it's, it's it's weakening falling. it, et cetera, et cetera. So. Uh, the Franciscans now have the the uh, the responsibility of of doing that part of the tomb. Tell me about taxes, which is an ongoing difficulty for you all. Well, if you if you remember, and you well you well oh, yes, remember, in the the fundamental agreement of December uh, 1993, they've been discussing what to recognize the recognition of Israel, but in return they were going to be talking about taxes and property between the Vatican and Israel. The Vatican and Israel. Mm -hmm. Okay, 26 years later. They're still talking. And what had happened was the, the incident that caused the Holy Sepulchre to be closed was that the mayor of Jerusalem at the time uh, had asked the Israeli government for an amount for the budget for, for, the, for the municipality of Jerusalem. Well, they didn't give it. So on his own, on his own he, he went out and told the Greek Orthodox and the, and the Franciscans, and the, we are going to start taking furniture from your from the hotel so this that you what? own and that started the 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 closing of the of the holy sepulcher mm. and then Netanyahu a few uh, about a week later uh, said we're going to have a committee to study this proposal mm -hmm. they've had two committee meetings already I wasn't privy to either of those council meetings but uh, it's like an ongoing situation wow. so yeah Wow. But we have to understand that the the properties that the Greeks have, they're they're a vast land prop, they're prop real estate. They have they're very very well to do. The Franciscans have some, but for example, our Casanovas, uh, pilgrim houses, mm -hmm. where we make a very small profit, that money is needed to to feed our feed our friars, to take care of the everyday needs, the financial needs that we have, uh, and so this is one of the concerns that. Okay, they're not taxing the churches, mm -hmm. but they're taxing, for example, Notre Dame would uh, be the same thing. Uh, That's uh, making it a church so property. Church property and, and even pilgrimage uh, groups. Why is, would they do that when this is the heart, the lifeblood of the pilgrimage uh, uh, business, which sustains Israel? 65% of the people who come to the Holy Land are Christians. So it just backs up what you just said, that we, we are the major force of, of supporting Israel. Think about it. And so why this is, uh, there's maybe political situations involved here, I don't know, but it's very strange. I mean, we, you know, the Franciscans have been there for 800 years. Uh, we've, we've done so much. Uh, and I, ha I have no idea why that they're pushing this thing now, trying to confiscate or to have us pay taxes. Mm -hmm. But it was a luge of, of, uh, from world leaders uh, to uh, Netanyahu, the prime minister, against us. Why are you taxing the, the churches? So it's an ongoing saga, Raymond. Mm -hmm. I don't know where it's going to end, but it's, 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 it's around. Well, we'll continue following yes, it as yes. time goes on. Father Peter Vasco, Very nice thank to you meet for being you. here. Take care. Thank you. Thank Great you. to see you. Great. <laughs> You can find out more about Father Peter Vasco and the work of the Franciscan Foundation for the Holy Land at FFHL.org. He's produced hit films like Heaven is for Real and is the best-selling author of The Truth About Men. I sat down with him recently to talk about his latest project, a film, Breakthrough, out in theaters this week. 
Here's my exclusive interview with Devon Franklin. Devon Franklin, thank you for being with us. Tell me about Breakthrough. Now, this story, I've been hearing about this movie for what seems like a year. Uh, what compelled you about this story and drove you to make this film? Yeah, you know, I was promoting Miracles from Heaven um, right. just not that long ago, uh, which was the film I produced. And while I was promoting that film, I ran into the real family that Breakthrough is based on. Mm. Um, I met Joy Smith and John Smith oh. and Pastor Jason Noble. And oh. Joy started telling the story of how she prayed her 14-year-old son, John Smith, mm. back to life after he died falling through a frozen lake. And when I heard her story, I knew immediately that this was a story I had to tell because it was just so inspirational. I mean, I've just never heard anything like it. Uh, the fact that her son was literally dead. The doctors had done all they could do. He was without a pulse uh, for, for over an hour. And they told her to go in the emergency room to say goodbye. And she doesn't go say goodbye. She goes in there and she prays. And the moment she prayed, uh, John Smith, her son, got her, his heart beat back, mm. and that was the beginning of a miraculous recovery. So that's why I wanted to tell it, because I think we need hope, I think we need inspiration, and mm. this true story, I believe, delivers that. Well, Chrissy Metz from uh, This Is Us, yeah. NBC's Big Drama, and Mike Coulter, who plays Luke Cage in the Marvel series. Uh, you, you've got some incredible actors in this, in this film. Yeah. Do you see more mainstream actors willing to work in this faith-centered space than you did before? You know, I think that the stigma um, sometimes that's associated with the space, the negative stigma that's sometimes associated with the space is beginning to uh, change. Mm -hmm. um, but fundamentally, I think it comes down to the project. Right. I don't think that any actor signs on to a project for a genre. Mm -hmm. They're signing on to it for the story and the characters. Right. So I believe as long as we continue to you know, develop scripts with great stories and great characters, we're going to continue to be able to attract uh, different types of actors um, to stories like this. And Breakthrough certainly is no exception, uh, being able to have Chrissy Metz and Josh Lucas and Topher Grace, and you mm. mentioned Mike Coulter, mm -hmm. as well as Dennis Haysbert, right. Sam Trammell, Marcel Ruiz. We have an all-star, diverse cast that has come together to bring this story to light, and it has everything to do with the power of the underlying true story. Now, now Devon, you have produced a slew of films. I mean, everything from uh, uh, Heaven is for Real to uh, uh, Jumping the Broom, uh, Miracles from Heaven, The Star. Do you find there's a growing market for films among this audience in America that perhaps is underserved? And why do you think that audience is making itself felt in this way now? You know, that's a good question, um, Raymond. I don't, I don't know exactly. Um, you know, I think, you know, not because it's, it's my film, but I think yeah. the success of Breakthrough mm -hmm. will help really answer that question. Uh -huh. You know, here's a movie that is high quality, great production values, incredible cast, you know, a lot of already, you know, excitement, anticipation. Mm -hmm. So I do believe that if Breakthrough works and people get behind this film and we literally see a breakthrough at the box office, I think it will say officially, yes, there is an audience, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people want more films like this. Last year around this time, my good friends, the Irwin brothers and Kevin Downs, they released I Can Only Imagine, mm -hmm. and that film, you know, shocked and wowed Hollywood. And I do mm -hmm. believe that if Breakthrough can do something similar, it will officially say and answer your question, which is, yes, the audience is here, the audience wants more, and now, you know, all of Hollywood's going to have to take notice mm -hmm. and begin to treat this audience as a real audience with yeah. real content and real support. The last two weeks in the top ten, we saw this unplanned movie, uh, this pro-life yep. film, Abby Johnson, about Abby Johnson's story. Um, what does that tell you? This movie did much better than Hollywood or anybody else thought it would. Were you surprised yeah. at the success of this movie? You know, I mean, I'm, I try never to be surprised with the success of, uh, you know, movies of faith because, uh, you know, I know that Hollywood can't track these films. Mm -hmm. And uh, the crazy thing is that every time a movie of faith works, just go and Google the headline. Oh, wow, a surprise hit. <laughs> Unbelievable. Un I, mean, you, I mean, literally, as long as I've been involved in making faith films, this is always the narrative. Right. So, um, no, I wasn't surprised. I know that that true story had a really strong core following mm -hmm. and a lot 
lot of people that were in the, in that pr in the, the press around it, you yep. know, really helped motivate and propel that growth. Mm -hmm. So I'm feeling like, you know, this audience is not so much underserved, it's underrated. Ah. And I think that's why Hollywood continues to mm -hmm. uh, overlook it. Um, but again, with the success, hopefully a breakthrough, I think yep. it'll finally bring this audience to the forefront. And uh, Hollywood is going to have to take notice and, and begin to treat it like any other genre audience with yeah. real movies, real support, and continued, um, you know, yeah. financing to reach them. Well, Mel Gibson kind of cracked this open, what, what, 14 years ago now. And then since then, we've seen some films tap into that excitement. So uh, uh, Breakthrough could be the next, uh, you know, the next uh, major benchmark here of this audience making their stand and making their voices heard. I want to show you a little clip of the trailer for Breakthrough Watch. Boys, get off the ice! We're training for the Olympics, sir! Cindy! God! He's been underwater for more than 15 minutes. It's gonna be a recovery, not a rescue. I got something. We got him! We've done everything medically possible. There's nothing more we can do. <laughs> no! Please, God, send your Holy Spirit to save my son. A 14-year-old St. Charles boy who spent 15 minutes trapped underwater is continuing to fight for his life. We're not gonna get through this alone. Ah! Whatever you have for me, for Brian, for John, I surrender. Devon, I wanna ask you about your latest book. Um, it just yes. came out recently, The Truth About Men. And in it, you write about Training the dog, also known as the lust problem. <laughs> what do you mean by training the dog? Um, yeah, you know, well, it's all about mastery, you know, right. and I believe that every man, uh, we have love and lust in us. Mm -hmm. And for us to be the men we were called to be, the men that God wants us to be, we have to learn how to lead and love. Uh, but that's very hard for us because we weren't taught to love ourselves. Uh, and it's very hard to give love um, when we don't know how to receive love. And so I talk about, you know, in the book, I use this analogy. So love is called the master. Lust is called the dog. I believe that lust is the thing that, ta that really impacts that it uh, impacts most men in a negative way. Mm -hmm. So for us to get control, discipline, uh, for us to become men of integrity and character, we have to master the dog within. We've got to put love in control of lust. We have to put selflessness over selfishness. And this is when we can really become the men God created us to be. Mm -hmm. And I wrote this book as a manual on how to do it. Too often, um, you know, within communities of faith, mm -hmm. we suppress, we don't discuss. Mm -hmm. And I believe that anything we suppress, we empower to destroy us. Mm -hmm. And it's time to start being truthful, transparent, and honest about our struggles so that we can get victory over them and no longer suffer in silence. And I believe this book will help not only just men, but women as well, because women don't have enough information about us. They don't know what's really going on with the men they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So this book will give women information as well as, as propelling men to become the men we were created to be and giving us the roadmap on how to do it. Uh, Devon, this is a very personal book to you, too. I mean, yeah. uh, you, you're right. Your father cheated on your mom. Uh, and, and I know that had to be difficult. How did that change or shape the man you wanted to be and would become? That knowledge. Oh, it, I mean, it, yeah, it changed. Uh, well, it shaped it. I wouldn't say changed because mm -hmm. I found it so, I found out so early yeah. um, that I don't know that I had yet a point of view about the man I wanted to be when I discovered mm -hmm. that my father had cheated on my mother. But what it did as I grew into, uh, you know, adulthood out of adolescence mm -hmm. and into manhood, it definitely shaped uh, the man I wanted to be because finding out that my father, before he passed away, cheated on my mother, you know, was devastating. Mm -hmm. And I began mm -hmm. to ask the question, can men be faithful? Do all men cheat? Why is it so hard for sometimes to, for us to stay committed and see that commitment all the way through? And so the shaping of my uh, adulthood and manhood really helped me, you know, navigate that question and pursue an answer to that question. And part of the being transparent was to admit these things about myself, uh, about my family, mm -hmm. uh, as a way to help other men and women as they read the book know that we're all in this together. Yeah. There's too much finger pointing. There's too much judgment. We got to get back to the place of love and empathy and 
and understanding. We can never become who God wants us to be as men and women if we keep judging each other, if we keep talking at one another. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find that when we're truthful and we do it in love, that's when we can begin the process of not only healing, mm -hmm. but actually transformation. So uh, it all started with me being transparent. Two quick questions. Last week, the state of Georgia voted on this heartbeat bill that would prohibit abortion once a heartbeat's detected. In response, some Hollywood actors have threatened the state of Georgia, uh, threatening to pull projects out of the state that they're shooting and denying the state the money associated with those projects. What do you make of that response? Is that threat warranted? Well, you know, look, I think the issue, this issue is so sensitive. And, and even going back to the, the, the thrust of the book, mm -hmm. too often we talk at one another, not with one another. Mm -hmm. This issue is so sensitive and it's so big that what, what happens is that everything gets, happened, gets handled in the headlines. Mm -hmm. You know, so Hollywood says this and Georgia says this and, and people on this side say that, people on that side yeah. say this. What about us coming together mm -hmm. and having a healthy dialogue so that mm -hmm. we can begin to understand both sides and figure out where the mm -hmm. common ground is? So that's really what I would hope would come from this so that no longer these, you know, uh, one-liners are just happening from both sides in the media mm -hmm. and then there's really no mediation of what really should be done and how it should be handled. Mm -hmm. Final question. How do you want Breakthrough to be received by audiences and why should they come? Yeah. You know, I want Breakthrough to be received by audiences, uh, you know, in the spirit in which it was made. Mm -hmm. uh, this movie truly puts on display the real superhero. I know everybody loves mm -hmm. uh, all these Marvel films, and hey, I like them too, but let's be honest, those are all make-believe and made up. Right. Uh, I can tell you they're made in computers and they're made on, on green screen, <laughs> but Breakthrough puts on display a real superhero, a praying mother, mm -hmm. and she displays the real superpower, which is prayer. So I want everybody to watch Breakthrough and come out of the theater inspired and excited. Uh, whether or not all your prayers have been answered, it doesn't take away the fact that God still is in the prayer answering business, mm -hmm. that he still is in the miracle working business. And I believe breakthrough confirms that. So my hope is people come out of the theater and that they have that revelation and that they're also reminded that the underlying message is love. Love mm -hmm. absolutely wins. Um, the love of God, the love of each other. Going back to the, even the question we were just talking about, mm -hmm. uh, too often we have differences and we let those differences become barriers to community mm -hmm. and barriers to unity. Breakthrough mm -hmm. says, even though I may not agree with you, I'm going to still pray with you. I'm still going to pray for you. Mm -hmm. I'm still going to pray that God's blessings be upon you. What would happen if we came out of the theater and we said, yeah, I may have a difference of opinion on a wide variety of things, mm -hmm. but you're still God's child. I still want to be there with you. I still want to pray with you. My hope is that Breakthrough will inspire that kind of mm -hmm. unity. And I, I've already been screening this movie all around the country. Yeah. You're going to have to bring your Kleenex and your popcorn because this movie <laughs> is going to it's going to blow you away. It's going to make you cry happy tears of joy. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that people walk out of the theater holding their, their loved one, hugging their friends, and letting them know that God loves them and that they mm -hmm. would feel loved too. And this comes out Wednesday, April 17th, just in time for Easter. Oh. And I'm praying for a breakthrough at the box office this Easter season. Yeah, I think it's coming. Yeah, we need that. Oh, we need amen. that. And no, I, I, yes, we how do. How often do we leave theaters either confused, offended, or angry? We need another emotion when we march out of the Cineplex. This sounds like a great one. Devon Franklin, amen. thank you for being here. My brother, thank you as always we'll for having me. Talk to you me. soon. Breakthrough starring Chrissy Metz and Josh Lucas, produced by Devon Franklin, is out in theaters now. Check your local listings. My final guest is a familiar face to EWTN viewers and a longtime host. He's a priest of the New York Archdiocese and author of the new book, Grace and Truth, 20 Steps to Embracing Virtue and Saving Civilization. Here's my interview with Father George Rutler. <laughs> Father Rutler, thank you for being here. Thank you, Raymond. Hey, you know, I, get, something off, get something off my chest. All right, go ahead. Come on, Whenever they come on television, they say, thank you for having me. It's become a kind of liturgical mantra. <laughs> Lack of imagination drives you crazy. Well, now, wait a minute, uh, Father. So you don't want to you don't want to observe the rubrics and form here. That is the no. that's the rubrics of our little liturgy here. Our yeah, fake I know liturgy, liturgy on TV. It, it just annoys me. But anyway, <laughs> let's let let's let sleeping dogs lie. Thank you for having well, me. Well, and I am thankful for having you, really. I have to say that sometimes, but I actually am this time. <laughs> so in your introduction to this book, uh, Grace and Truth, you write, none of his, Christ's followers, have had a better opportunity to spread his gospel than we do in our generation. It is dreadful to think how much we squander that opportunity and use the media so inadequately. 
Um, why have those efforts been so woeful? And uh, you mentioned Mother Angelica in your introduction as well. Talk to me a little bit about her influence on this third anniversary of her passing. For well, I hope I'm not squandering that opportunity now. Why did, why did our why, why did our Lord preach from a fishing boat on occasion? Ah, uh, to be better heard. He, to be better heard, the acoustic effect on the water. Mm -hmm. He's he is true God, but he's also true man, and in his humility, you know, as the Philipp, letter to the Philippians mm -hmm. says, he humbles himself to took on the form of a slave, which in part means he took on obedience to the natural law that he himself had created, and among, amongst those laws are the laws of acoustics. Mm -hmm. So by going into a, micro, uh, into a boat, he had a kind of microphone effect going there on mm -hmm. the water. He could be heard better, and he could be, be seen better. Uh, so we know full well how the media has dis misled people and propagated terrible, terrible lies. Mm -hmm. The 20th century is a good example of mm. that. The communists and the Nazis, amongst other things, although politically in some ways different, they had a common agreement that the way to influence people, to change people, was to monopolize uh, the media. Mm -hmm. G.K. Chesterton talked about the day, well, in his day, the BBC, mm. uh, the danger of government control of yeah. of the media. So I, I think that you know, in every age, the Holy Spirit raises up people to address problems of the age, but also to use the gifts of the age. In mm -hmm. the Middle Ages, scholar, he created scholars, architects. And in our age, I think he's raised up some people to be the evangels of of the media. Mother mm -hmm. Angelica was one of them. It still is a, an enigma to me why we got on, because we were very different, different personalities. Yeah. I remember once she said that uh, I was too intellectual for her. <laughs> and um, it reminded me of you, William F. Buckley, <laughs> Jr., one of my flock. Mm -hmm. I I I uh, knew him well, and yes. I I had his funeral. Mm -hmm. In his book *Nearer My God*, he said that my my vocabulary was beyond him, and I could see him smiling when he wrote that because nobody had a vocabulary like beyond Bill him. <laughs> exactly. But so I was like, when Mother when Mother Angelica said that my intellect was beyond her. Well, she didn't have all the diplomas on the wall. But her mind, she knew what she was saying. Mm -hmm. But she had the gift of discernment. She did indeed. Uh, and, uh, well, in retrospect, one advantage of being God is you always win in the end. Mm. And we know how, in many cases, she was very set upon, very much criticized, yes. very, very much challenged. Mm -hmm. She took on one pompous cardinal, mm -hmm. part of the tautology, <laughs> Uh, Not only and, one, uh, one famously. Uh, uh, she took on a number of them, as I recall. But uh, he's in disgrace now. Yes, he is. Doesn't, the truth has and, come out. Uh, Again, yeah, the grace uh, and yeah. truth has emerged. And, and God willing, not to be presumptuous, I think Mother is now in a very blessed, mm -hmm. happy position. We just have to take consolation in that. And before we go, Will Wilder 3, The Amulet of Power, and the rest of the series is available now at bookstores everywhere as well. That is all the time we have. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, you can follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. Have a blessed Holy Week and a happy Easter. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.